<laughs> Doug quoted that verse about how we speak mysteries. And uh, in, in, in the context of saying that you're speaking mysteries, that when you pray in tongues, you're not speaking unto men, you're speaking unto God. And you're speaking mysteries. Mysteries to who? Somebody asked me a question the other day. Well, I sent out an email after Warren Hunter taught on the power of speaking in tongues. I have a teaching. It's one of the most uh, popular videos. And it was actually the very... The, no, it wasn't the first. It was probably the... Excuse me. Probably the second video that I put out that I, would, that I left on our YouTube channel years ago when we were in Republic uh, up by Springfield was on overcoming hindrances to speaking in tongues. And so we have now uh, close to 300 people who have given their life to Jesus uh, or rededicated their life to Jesus through our evangelism initiative, newexpectations.net. And of course, we connect to them, we prophesy over them, we give them a 52-week uh, Bible uh, course, we connect them to all of our online resources, to eChurch, to Media Church, which is our web church portal, and uh, we, we assign intercessors to pray and to connect with these people and pray with them. And the Lord says, now that they have the other, uh, about two-thirds of them, maybe about 80 percent, they have first-time people, first time coming to the Lord, about 20 percent are people rededicating their life to Christ. We said, now what you need to do is you need to get the baptism in the Holy Ghost. And so I sent out a little brief email and I explained, I said, watch Warren Hunter's uh, message first because it would motivate them. He dealt with it so powerfully. Uh, and I said, then, if you don't speak in tongues, if you haven't received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, watch this video, and it will help you understand. It's a completely different take on the baptism of the Holy Spirit, because when you're born again, uh, it's just like being born the first time. You are born with the capacity of speech, but it's a while before you speak. But yet it's, it's in you. Yes. And it's just like a person who gets born again in their spirit. They have the capacity of spiritual speech. And what actually happens without going into it at too great a length is you have to learn how to relinquish. See, you can get the baptism in the Holy Ghost by process or by outcome. But God can just drop it on you like you did on the day of Pentecost. A lot of people get it that way. That's how I got it. But that's not the only way to receive. You can receive it by process. And here's how you receive it by process. You cause that person to understand that the speech center of their brain has held the reins to their tongue their whole life. That's how God made the human body, the, the body-mind connection. But your the mind is not the only thing capable of controlling the speech center of your brain. Your spirit can also control the speech center of your brain and talk out your mouth. Mm -hmm. But the mind is like, you, you remember the first time you had a little toddler? And the first time your little toddler had a little friend come over to play? Like maybe the next door neighbor, she had a little boy, a little girl about that same age, and they'd never, your baby had never yet been around other babies that they weren't related to. And sweet little baby, sweet, sweet little baby. But, and got all the toys around, but you put down a baby they don't know. And that baby they don't know reaches and picks up their toy. What happens? <laughs> mind! Mind! <laughs> and your mind is that way. Your mind, particularly when we're, when we're spiritual babies, your, your mind does not want to let go of its toy, that yeah. which it's familiar with. No, no, no. I can't let you, I can't let my spirit have access to the speech center of my brain. That's mine. I don't want to relinquish that. See? But yet, you understand that you have the capacity for speech. Your spirit has the capacity. Your, your, your mind funnels its thoughts to the speech center of your brain and it comes out in language and you know what you're saying or sometimes we don't know what we're saying. <laughs> and, uh, but in the spirit, it's not the thoughts originating in your mind. 
its thoughts originating in the mind of God. So that when you speak in tongues, a portal is created where the mind of God flowing through your intuition without benefit, not bothering to check with your mind. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to explain this to you, just relax. <laughs> and begins to speak the mysteries to God. Why is he speaking mysteries to God? Because God created the world by saying, let there be. He did not think, let there be, he could have. That's why God told me, he said, prayer that is not verbal is just wishful thinking. Mm -hmm. There's something about saying it. Yes, yes, yes. And when we say it, and so what, what are we doing? We have the thoughts of God. He gives us his thoughts, and we say those thoughts back to him. Watchman Nee said, here's, the, here's how prayer works. God establishes his will. He communicates his will. We return his will back to him in prayer, and he accomplishes his will in the earth. That's why, that's how prayer works. Same way with uh, the baptism in the Holy Ghost and praying in tongues. Why do we have to speak mysteries to God? He knows everything. Because God wants to communicate his will to us, even if it's uh, not by benefit of notifying your mind. It's like dreams. Job 33, 14 through 17 says that uh, God speaks once, yea, twice in a dream in the vision of the night to keep man from pride, to keep his foot from being taken in a snare. He seals instruction. That's the dream you had that you can't remember. As soon as you wake up, you can't remember. It's still active because your spirit got it. See? Mm -hmm. So it's still producing on the inside of you. And so, and so it becomes, you return God's will to him in a mystery. In, in speaking in tongues. And it's still effective in the earth. It's not important whether you understand it or not. Right. And i got news for you. If you want to get to a place where everything you say and do becomes as effective as if God said it or did it, you have to realize that he said in Isaiah, you'll go out with joy and be led forth with peace, not go out with intellect and be led forth with understanding. Right. <laughs> People say, if I just understood, if you just understood that you are limiting God to only operating in the realm of your understanding and the enemy can trip that up. Yes. But whenever you see your mind can't keep up with God, his thoughts are not our thoughts, but your will can. You can yield to God at the pace that he reveals his mind to you. you yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. I don't understand it, but yes, Lord, yes, Lord. And so part of how tongues works is, is being able to usurp the tyranny of the mind that tries to sit in your life where Jesus sits enthroned in your heart. Why, God? If I just understood why, I could cooperate. No, that's the mind, it's the tyranny of the intellect saying it will control, it will be Lord of your life instead of Jesus being Lord of your life. By giving God permission to tell you to do things that you will comply with even though you don't understand. <laughs> and tongues is like the training wheels for how that works. <laughs> Glory. So, and it's connected with something here. Now, think about it. You're speaking mysteries to God. Your mind does not understand. There's something in God's character that delights in something that is not understood. He speaks mysteries. It's the glory of God to conceal a matter. The glory of kings to find it out. You're desperate. Your life's falling apart. You absolutely need an answer and you need it now and God wants to play hide and seek. <laughs> you know, you're in the midst of your enemies. They're bearing down on you and he wants to, you know, he's sort of pulling his sword out. He wants to put out a table and give you something to eat. <laughs> so, I mean, God just so doesn't think the way we think. Uh, but it was interesting in Psalm 81.5, it says that it describes, it's God speaking, and he's passing through Egypt, gathering up the Hebrews, and about to take them out, and the, the death angel's going to come, and all the firstborn of Egypt are going to die. And he's describing, he said, I was going through Egypt, gathering my elect, and while I was doing that, I heard a language that I understood not. Whose language was that? It was the language of the Egyptians. 
Now, metaphorically, Egypt is the world, the language of the natural mind, the language of the carnal mind, the, lang the, the intellect or the mentality that says, knowledge is power. That is he that sits in the temple of God, declaring himself to be God. It's the intellect trying to usurp the throne of God in your life. And God says, I, I, did not under, I, I don't understand that language. And when God chooses not to understand something, can you imagine? God in his sovereignty, incapable of thinking anything that doesn't come to pass, chooses not to understand the language of the Egyptians. That, that just goes so deep we could talk about that for a while. And then today in Psalm 101, 4, we read that a froward heart or a perverse heart, always think about Zechariah, with the perverse, I'll show myself perverse, God said. That's why Jesus always answered questions with questions. With the perverse, have you ever heard any man speak like this man? Because he didn't need to be understood. It said without him, he said, why do you speak to them in parables? And he's got a frog in your pocket? What do you mean? I was, he was talking to them too. The only thing that distinguished the twelve from the, the rest of the crowd is they came and asked. The difference between a disciple and a follower is what do they do with their questions? It's not what you do with your answers. The answers many times are just the, the uh, watermark of where you got tired of thinking about it and decided to make up your mind. <laughs> I always said I'm more comfortable with my questions than I am with everybody else's answers. I'm much, much more with greater sense of security stand before God and answer to him for my questions than I will be with everybody else and their pat answers. <laughs> And he said, a froward heart shall depart from me. Now let's think about it. I'll not know their language. He gives us a language that nobody knows. Call it Tabas. He said, a froward heart shall depart from me. I will not know a wicked person. Now, when we say that, that's just a sentiment. It's a cast-off statement. This is God talking. I will not, I, I don't understand their language. I will not know them. That's, there's, there's a deep there that needs to be plumbed. And it echoes, say, well, what does that have to do with Old Testament? But Jesus said in Matthew 7, 33, I profess to them, I never knew you. Yeah. Depart from me, you that work in me. Oh, my goodness. Now, Don said we learn our language from our parents. <laughs> How did he tell them you were of your father? After he listened to them, he heard their language. Your language belies or reveals your paternity. The paternity that is in you, either the paternity of God or the paternity of the And then Isaiah 51, 16, I have put my words in my mouth and I have covered you in the shadow of my hand that I might think about that, in the shadow of my hand that I may plant the heavens. When you put something in shadow, it's in a mystery. Think about it. He put us, he put us, the native environment of a believer is an enigmatic thing. That's why when you got saved, two weeks later, the Jehovah Witnesses or the Mormons knocked on your door and they talked you out intellectually out of <coughs> your belief. They say, look, I can't argue with you, but I know in my knower. They can maybe get something out of your head, but they couldn't get it out of your heart. <coughs> now I want to lay something else with you. The Lord, the Lord's been talking to me about <coughs> Hebrews 13.8. And here's the back... The, the, the backwards way God teaches me. God will tell me something, and then he'll say, if you'll check this out, you'll say I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> Fact check, God. 
And he kept nagging me with Hebrews 13.8, which is a very simple scripture. And, and I trust, and I just sat down here this evening, came a few minutes early, and saw this. And I hope I can convey it, or at least give you something to meditate on. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus Christ the same. And the Lord said, look that word same up. And it's the word same is where we get the word auto, as in automatic. It comes from a root word that means baffling wind. Think about Jesus when he talked to Nicodemus. He that is born of the Spirit is like the wind. You don't know where it's coming from, and you don't know where it's going. It's a baffling wind. And I've got news for you. It's like Abraham. Looked for a city whose builder maker was God, but he said he went out and he knew not where. Not only is the person who's born of the Spirit not understood, you don't know where he's coming from, you don't know where he's going, he doesn't know <laughs> where he's coming from. It's like the two prophets got together and said, I'm okay, are you, uh, are you you're okay, am I okay? <laughs> yeah. it, it also means the air. The air. And just make a little bookmark there, we're going to come back to that. It's where the word air comes from, like in the immediate lower atmosphere. We're going to come back to that. It, it, it also means to, now the idea of being automatic, it also means to breathe unconsciously. Autonomic. Is there such thing as something being autonomic with God? He said, he that touches you touches the apple of my eye. Pupil. That tells me that God is capable of having an autonomic response to defend and protect us. Mm -hmm. That he doesn't have to think about it. We were studying this the other day, and, and people teach, Christian theology, popular theology teaches that God makes up his mind on a case-by-case -case basis, even about the merits of the cross. Yes, he provided healing, but he might heal you, he might not. God always answers prayer. Sometimes he says no. And they apply that even to the merits of the cross. And people believing for healing or something like that. But as we've been studying in the Old Testament, I found, I found out that he has an autonomic response when it comes to mercy. Where he does decide on a case-by-case -case basis is in the matter of judgment. And we know that. We know that every school of theology going back to the time of Augustine teaches that one day we're going to stand and on a case-by-case -case basis, moment by moment, scene by scene in our life, God is going to pass judgment upon our lives. And we think, oh, that's terrible. Actually, it's not. What it's saying is God is so prone to mercy... I'm not about to, to pass any kind of judgment, either judgment of reward or judgment of punishment, unless I deal with it on a case-by-case -case basis. But when it comes to mercy, I'm going to have an autonomic response. It's just automatic. All of the promises of God in Him, 2 Corinthians 1.20, all the promises of God in Him are yes and amen. Yes. In other words, His default posture towards you is a green light. Ask what you will and it shall be done. And all the Pharisees and all the scribes and all the hypocrites put in, but it has to be something you want, uh, need. It can't be something you want. It can't be contrary to his will. It can't be this. It can't be that. One of the most powerful impact of the fear of God on me is I found out, ask what you will and it shall be done unto you better. Pay attention to what you're asking. Amen. For. Amen. I have found there is nothing he won't do for me. Who? And we got Bible for it. Yes. God will you, yes. <laughs> and amen to the glory of God by us. Years ago, I don't even know where this originated, but I might have said it, I don't remember, but we don't have to overcome God's reluctance to move in our life because he doesn't have any. I was dealing with pretense in my prayer life. Good Pentecostal boy. Oh, most merciful, omnipotent, heavenly Father, that you would look, I, I beseech thee humbly that thou wouldst look down upon me from thy lofty heavens and have mercy upon this mortal coil. 
think it's a big struggle of my life is to overcome Pentecostal pretense, you know. And the Lord said, you're doing that because you think you have to convince me. But my default posture towards you is yes. God so loved that he gave. That's good. Now, let's take this a step further. He's the same. He's automatic. We have Old Testament for it. Touch, touch you. He's touch, you're touching the people of God. <coughs> he has an autonomic response. It means to breathe. And he's un, he unconsciously blesses you. He's not even exercising his volition, which is why he said, by his stripes you were healed. The whole depth of understanding the finished work is the fact that God's already made his mind up. He's not deciding on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. And so here we live in a spiritual environment described by that word saint. He's the same. Now picture that as an environment. Picture that as the spiritual atmosphere that we live in and that Adam was created in, but he steps out into that atmosphere of the, of the autonomic willingness of God to bless as his primary benefit as God's cre creation, and he takes that benefit, and by disobedience, he gives it over to the devil, and the devil becomes the prince of the power of the what? The air. air. Of the air, which is the same word, Jesus Christ, the same. Yes. The, and think about it. In the fall, and Paul teaches on this in the Roman road, in the fall, everything tends to decay. It's autonomic. You go clear a piece of a patch of ground in your backyard, tomatoes are not going to come up. Flowers are not going to come up. What's going to come up? Thorns, briars, thistles, and weeds. And you can go pull them up and they're going to come right back. You don't have to do anything to make a weed grow. You don't have to do anything to make something rot. You don't have to do anything to make something tend to decay. It takes effort. Why? Because you got to know what Adam gave up. He turned that autonomic capacity of the environment God gave him, he handed the keys to that to the devil, and the devil says everything will not tend to blessing, everything will tend to decay. But what Adam broke in the Garden of Eden, Jesus repaired in the Garden of Gethsemane. He said, in, in, Paul said in Romans, he said, As a death reigned by one, even so life shall reign by one. And how did he do it? He despoiled, he took those keys. What keys? The keys to that ambient autonomic environment where God takes creation and takes a new creation and he puts you on autopilot to your Hallelujah. blessing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I hope I can I hope I could say that. I hope I could convey what I saw there. There's something there that resounds. I don't know that I've ever seen anything so deep in the world. The course of this world. The tongue is a fire set on fire of hell. But the word's a two-edged sword, so it's, it comes forth in the negative edge, but you look in the positive, yes, it's a fire, but it could also bring blessing. Yes. So it talks about Ephesians 2.2, 2, where in times past you walked according to the course of this world, everything tending to decay, according to the prince of the power of the air. How did he get to be that way? By Adam, with Adam's help, with Adam's yieldedness. The spirit that now works in the children of disobedience to causing their lives to tend to decay. But God intends our lives to tend to blessing. How do we get there? Well, one way we get there is by getting out of our head and getting into our heart. You cannot keep up with God in your head. You have to keep up with God by a yielded will. What Kim was talking about, saying yes to God. Having an autonomic response to God. With the forward, I will show something. When you put your commitment to me on autopilot, I will put my response to you on autopilot. With the forward, I will show myself forward. You see? Or the opposite of that, with the faithful, I will show myself faithful. 
And whenever you, see, your mind can't keep up with God, but your will can. You can say yes to him even if you don't understand. And when you do that, see, God, God moves faster than Satan. And so as long as you aren't requiring God to explain to your finite <coughs> mind that the enemy can keep up with or hadn't you noticed, that's why you can put doubt there, that's why you can put temptation there, and all of that, as long as you're requiring God, I see people tears on their face. If I just understood what God wanted, I could obey. No, obey whether you understand or not. And then all of a sudden you're saying yes to God, yes to God, yes to God. And you start outpacing. You start coming out from under the Paul, the P-A-L-L, the Paul of the curse. Right? Because you're hastening unto. Remember the scripture talks so much about that, running the race, hastening unto. All of a sudden you're keeping up with God. And Satan can't keep up with God. He's trying to lay traps for you because he thinks he knows where you'll be tomorrow morning. But because you're responding to God at the pace that God thinks, you are suddenly stepping out from under the cloud of the curse and walking under the blessing. It is the Acts 14.22 principle where through much tribulation you enter the kingdom. And that word means manifold pressure. What's the pressure? It's the pressure of your mind demanding that the will not submit to God, but submit to me. Or if you're going to submit to God, do it on my terms. No, I'm not going to. You sit down and shut up. And I'm just going to respond to God. And all of a sudden, the enemy set up and he springs his trap and he comes up empty. Because he thought you would be here. He's not infinite. He's not all-knowing. And you're over here. Surprise. Doing something, it's what I call the chaos decision. <laughs> and it's only chaotic to the natural mind. They thought the universe, try and wrap this up, they thought the universe was just sprang out of chaos at a quantum level, but they found out 20 years later that what they thought was total mathematical chaos was not mathematical chaos at all. They just didn't have the mathematical models to discern the scope of the pattern that existed, and they began to discover something called fractals, that they could only just uh, understand it and express it in these beautiful images and pictures, if you've ever seen a fractal. And uh, so it's really not chaos, it's just an order that is beyond the scope of your mind to comprehend. This looks crazy, but I know it's God. <laughs> and you do it, and then everything you say and do begins to be as effective as if God said it or did it, which is what he meant in Romans when he said the kingdom of God is righteousness. Righteousness means the ability to stand up right before God. But on a ground level, what does that mean? What does that, what's the benefit of that? Is you're living in entitlement. Everything you say and do begins to be as effective as if God said it or did it because you are walking in pace with God. This was the very thing, going back to tongues. Hey, I'm going to wrap this up for <laughs> When he said he came, Adam, he's sewing fig leaves together. Makes sense, right? He's sewing fig leaves together and he heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the cool of the day. If you study that language out, and I'm a big one for looking at the original languages, it can also be rendered that he heard the sound of the Lord God whirling upon the breezes. Mm -hmm the voice of many waters. And he said, thanks but no thanks. And it was 4,000 years later that 120 people on the day of Pentecost heard the sound of the Lord God whirling uh, upon the breezes. And they said, we'll take you up on that. Call Tavos, Tavos, Tavos. What a powerful, powerful truth. There's something there, folks, and I just, Amen. I think I could think about that for a long time and get more out of it. The ambient atmosphere of God's blessing. People think it's a special blessing from God. No, it's just getting out of the fallen environment. The autos, the sameness that the devil controls, and get, getting into autopilot with God. The autopilot of his blessing. Called Gina, may I prophesy to you? Yes. Now, uh, Terry 
Lynn Cooper and Terry Allen and Dwayne and Sharon. If you, you know, I invite you to help with this since you've all and anyone else who gets a word from God, Sherry Milburn. God wants us to minister to Gina. Yes. Yeah. We're recording it, Gina. So we'll get your um, email address. Okay. So Kitty suggested, and your husband's name again? Jeff. Jeff. This is from Jeff and Gina. Kitty suggested that I ask the Lord, and I love asking God questions. It's like putting a nickel in a, you know, that bomb. That M, remember the MCI bomb sound, you know, from the phone. From the phone. Yeah. You used to have to pay for long distance. Uh, God delights in answering questions. Uh, the Lord told me that you and your husband are a trebuchet. Do you know what a trebuchet is? I don't. <laughs> it is a French word for what we would kind of call a catapult, but it's really not a catapult, and you ought to look it up whenever you get on the internet and get home because it's actually, it's, it's almost like the slingshot that David used to slay Goliath. Except it is, it's on a stand, it's called a siege device. It was used in the Middle Ages to sling large stones against ancient foundations of like castles and fortresses and strongholds and bring them down. And the, and, a, and the Lord reminded me of that verse, how we talk about the enemy's devices. He said, I have devices as well. He said, and Jeff and Gina are a siege device to take the rock that Daniel 2.45 says was cut out of the mountain and hurl it against ancient foundations of the enemy and to destroy the foundations of the enemy everywhere you go. And there is, and you study that trebuchet and you're going to understand at times, there is, when that stone is slung, it reaches this tipping point where at first it's just kind of rocking back and forth but then there's this trigger that the one who's controlling it, and it reaches this point where it becomes like a slung stone, like David when he took the five stones and he hit and he hit Goliath right in the forehead. That's exactly how the, the cadence of your life, you'll begin to measure and get a sense for what's going to happen next based on the movement. You know, sometimes things are moving in your life, and you can be sitting still, but you sense the movement of God in your life. Because just as the enemy, Jeff and Gina, has devices, even so I have devices. And my devices cannot be defeated. The two of you and your ministry, you are like a trebuchet. And God said, I will take you into an area, I'll set you up, and you will, you know, some people are called to pull down. And I will use you for the pulling down of strongholds. You'll walk, you're going to hear these words if you haven't heard them already. You'll have pastors and people that you minister to who will say, you have no idea how much we've changed, how much our situation changed, how much our church has changed, how much our circumstances have changed since we met you. Everything has changed. It's because God says, I'm using you to pull down strongholds. And it's not because you're going to necessarily have to say, I pull down that stronghold. No, it's about going in and just being who you are and saying what he tells you to say. And the stone that you're, you're hurling is not the stone of a harsh message or not a harsh message, but it's the rock that the builders rejected. It's the rock of Christ Jesus. It's the rock that followed, that Paul said, followed the Israelites through the wilderness. It's the rock that after Moses struck the rock, spoke to the rock, so was supposed to. Then the third thing they did is all the people came and sang to the rock. And when they sang to the rock, the last time that it's recorded in Scripture, as first it was supposed to be struck, that was Jesus giving his life. The second time they were supposed to speak to it, that's the gospel coming forth. And then they sang to it. It's like their spirits became like a tuning fork and they resonated to the sound of God and the refreshing waters. I'm going to send you into dry places and you will sing to the rock and the people will be refreshed, says the Father, because you are a trebuchet. You are a device of righteousness to bring forth my purposes in the earth, 
says the Father, even as I said in my word, I would bring forth deliverers out of Zion. Yes. And that means out of the parched place. Sometimes we're in this parched place. God says, I have brought you out of dry seasons, and you're coming now into a season of upgrade. So begin to uh, begin to think, be more flexible in areas of planning. Do not uh, do not make inflexible choices about different parts of the infrastructure of your life, even in natural things, because what you'll wind up is you'll make an investment into something that's that cannot contain what I'm about to do. Just hold everything loosely because I'm seriously about to broaden your boundaries and your borders, says the Father. And when you've stretched those cords out as far as they can conceivably be stretched, the Father says, I'm going to take them and bring them three times longer than that. And people will say, you just can't stretch relationships like that. You can't stretch ministry like that. You can't. And they'll say, that's, that's not even possible. That defies the physics of how this works. But God says, I'm going to move in your life and in Jeff's life and in your and you're going to have this anointing of being flexible and being malleable to God and saying, We have no say, well, how's that work? We have no clue. Isn't that fun? <laughs> but it's working. It's working. And I'll begin to reproduce and reproduce. And I will bring you the wheels like Ezekiel's wheels that he saw in the glory of God. I will bring you to the place that the plowman overtakes the reaper, that the seeds of your obedience will produce a harvest even before you arrive. You'll show up and the move of God will precede you and you'll just simply define, they say, you'll, you'll be like Peter. Men and brethren, I know you don't know what's going on. Let me explain it to you. <laughs> Let me tell you, just as it was, the Father says, just as it was with Lonnie Frisbee. Wow study who he was. That he would step up in front of people and simply say, come kingdom, and Holy Ghost pandemonium would break out, yeah. and whole movements yeah. of God would be birthed. The Lord says, I will cut a broad swath of deliverance and glory in the land and reshape the spiritual landscape of the places and the towns and the peoples that I lead you to, says the Father, for you are carriers of my glory. And that will be made manifest and demonstrated in greater measure and with exponential impact from this day forward, says the Father. Ooh.